You didn't actually think that this was going to be pleasant, did you? I promised you a not-so-jolly Christmas, and that's what I'll be bringing to you. Are. You. Ready. <laughs> Welcome, friends, to a very special Creepmas episode. Before we get started, I want to wish all of you happy holidays, my sugar babies. All right, that's enough with the pleasantries. Let's get on to our special Creepmas episode. Tonight, I'm bringing you tales of demonic creatures that once roamed the streets of villages across Iceland, Western Europe, and the East. Christmas time might be a time for joy and festivity, but you already know how I feel about that. Not so long ago, tales of the dead and demonic forces roaming were a cause for concern, especially to naughty children. <laughs> As I mentioned, this is a bit of a different take on our previous Creepmas episodes, as I'll be adding some commentary. And you know that I'm into the naughty kind of commentary. So get ready to cover your ears. Settle down with your hot chocolate. Mmm, chocolate. And listen to the terrifying myths, legends, and folklores brought to you by our ancestors. Listener's discretion is advised. Let's start with our first seasonal monster. Krumpus. Krumpus resembles an anthropomorphic demonic goat who punishes misbehaving children. He rips out girls' pigtails, beats children with birch branches, and often carries a basket on his back so he can carry off a child of his choosing and consume them for Christmas dinner. The 5th of December is Krumpusnacht, the night where men in homemade Krumpus costumes charged around alpine villages with pitchforks, demanding booze and threatening strangers. Sounds like my kind of night. Genuine monsters from the fires of hell would probably have caused less destruction. I highly doubt. These Krumpus runs continue today and are a little more organized, but still terrifying to witness. Whilst many sinister Christmas characters peaked during the 15th and 16th centuries, interest in Krumpus has grown over time. The 19th century invention of Christmas cards saw an explosion of images of Krumpus sent around the world. Krumpus runs have spread to America too, and since 2013 there have been a series of Krumpus-related Christmas films presenting the character as an antidote to over-sentimental, festive celebrations. <laughs> Lucy. In Norway and Sweden, the 13th of December is St. Lucia's Day. St. Lucia is represented as a beautiful young woman, and nowadays the occasion is marked by a young woman in a white sash, representing the saint roaming the streets with a health and safety officer, baiting a crown of candles on her head. However, a few centuries ago, Norway celebrated Lucia, or Lucy, in a very different form. For the night before the 13th of December, Lucy's night was the night when evil spirits and demons rose up to wander the earth. Children needed to be good and the adults warded off evil by protecting their homes with the sign of the cross. Lucy was portrayed as a hideous demon with tyrannical powers. 
She rode through the skies on a broomstick accompanied by demons, evil spirits, and trolls, spreading mayhem and chaos, destroying property, crops, and livestock, and kidnapping or killing anyone foolish enough to not be tucked up safely in bed. Sounds like my kind of woman. The Karakonkolos. Known through Bulgaria, Turkey, and Serbia, the Karakonkolos is generally portrayed as a cross between the devil and a Sasquatch. Sounds terrifying. In Turkey, he would stand at street corners on winter nights, setting riddles for passers-by. If the traveler gave an answer that included the word black, they were free to go on their way. If not, he would strike them dead with a single blow. Elsewhere, the Karakonkola's favorite trick was to disguise their voice to pretend to be someone's friend or relative and lure their intended victim out into the snow. Sometimes the creature would set them in a trance and leave them to roam free, but in Serbia, the Karakonkolas preferred to jump on the victim's back and use them as a personal taxi service. <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry about that. <clears throat> Onwards with the story. The exhausted person was only released at dawn. If you invited a Karakankulas into your house, they would feel compelled to imitate their host's behavior. If you set fire to silk or thread, the Karakankulas would be tricked into setting fire to its own fur and would run from the house screaming to find water. The Galiganjari. In Greece, and also in Cyprus, but in Greece, a group of demons called the Kaliganjari were said to spend the year underground, sawing through the tree of life that ran through the earth. Each December, when just a single thread held the tree together, the twelve days of Christmas would compel them to come overground and wander the earth. By their return in January, the tree had repaired itself, and they had to start again. Once overground, they caused mischief and chaos but above all sought to steal any child born over the 12 days of Christmas and would turn the baby into one of them. They could be kept at bay by binding newborn babies in straw and garlic. You could also stop the creatures from getting into your house by placing a colander outside the door. The Kalikanjari would be compelled to count the holes, but because the number three is holy in Greek, they would fail to count that number and have to start again. This would occupy them until sunrise, when the house would be safe until darkness fell again. Frau Pesta. Well, I just said her name a bit dramatically, didn't I? I think I might tone it down a bit. <laughs> In pre-Christian traditions, Perchta was an alpine goddess whose particular celebration day coincided with the twelfth night. After pre-Christian religions were displaced, she instead became a demonic witch who stalked villages, punishing anyone who dared to displease her. Of course she did. Sometimes she appeared as a mischievous, disheveled old woman. Of course she was. Alternatively, her appearance could depend on how you perceived her and whether you had pleased her. I would please you. If you were faithful, obedient, and observed her rituals, Perchta would appear to you as a woman of divine beauty. If you angered her, she would appear as a demonic, horned monster with a ferocious bloodlust. Either way, she sounds like my kind of woman. She would let you be as long as you followed her rituals on Perchta's night, such as eating a traditional meal and special cakes baked in her honor. Should you fail to do that, she would sneak into your room whilst you slept, slit your belly open, and replace your innards with pebbles and straw. The following day, whoever discovered your corpse would assume you had simply died in your sleep. The Yule Lads Many of these creatures served as metaphors for surviving the horrors of winter. And, as Icelandic winters are tougher than most, it is unsurprising it has some of the most creative mythology. The 13 Yule Lads visit houses, one Yule Lad a day, between 12th and the 24th of December. Nowadays, they are depicted as tricksters, each with their own unique form of mischief. Spoon Licker steals wooden spoons to lick off the food residue. <laughs> What? Door Slammer slams the doors of the house all night so nobody can rest. And you can probably guess what Sausage Swiper gets up to. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> 
Historically, however, the Yule Lads were much more vicious, and in the 18th century, telling stories of the Yule Lads' behavior was a competitive activity, as each storyteller outdid the last with shocking tales of the gruesome brutality and gratuitous violence. The tales got so out of hand that in 1746, a public decree banned the foolish custom of scaring children with the Yuletide lads and ghosts. My question would be, but why? Gryla. All the Yule lads answer to Gryla, their mother. She predates the Yule lads in Icelandic legend as the ogress who kidnaps, cooks, and eats children who don't obey their parents. She only became associated with Christmas in the 17th century when she was assigned to be the mother of the Yule lads. According to legend, Gryla had three different husbands and 72 children. Damn, you got busy. Yolopuki. In Finland, they have Yolopuki, who is similar to Krumpus. He has horns and hooves like some kind of demonic goat, and he loves to beat naughty children with a tree branch until their backsides are bleeding. He comes to your house and asks, Are there any good children here? He doesn't bother giving out presents. Instead, you have to give him presents to avoid a beating. <laughs> Excuse me, kind sir. You stumbled across the wrong house. Here we don't give out presents. We enjoy a good whipping. Yo la colturin. That was the most horrific pronunciation. But what I tried to say was Yolkat in Icelandic. I butchered it. I absolutely butchered it. Here's a short scary story for you kids. Carissa's pronunciation. Now back to the story. It's not enough that you had to worry about the Yule lads and them coming to lick your wooden spoons. <laughs> their mother Gryla as well who would come and eat you you had to worry about their pet cat now for many a yule cat might conjure up images of a lovely kitten in a santa hat but yola culturine who first appeared in the 19th century was a huge ferocious beast with razor-like whiskers blazing eyes and terrible claws who consumed any child who did not receive new clothes on christmas day you're asking yourself, why did that child not receive new clothes on Christmas Day? That's because that child was a naughty child. I hope you enjoyed our special Creepmas episode on the demonic monsters our ancestors created to scare naughty children. Remember to stay safe this holiday season. I'm sending you much love, light, and many blessings, my sugar babies. From me, myself, and I, I hope you have a good night. I'm Carissa Vickis. And this was Beauty Unlocked's special Creepmas episode.